Well, it's that time for us to dig into the Word of God this evening, and I am very excited to pick up where we left off this morning in our study, brief study, of the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. I want to thank you all for your hospitality and for your generosity and for the care with which uh, you uh, gave me and looked after me this afternoon. We had a great time of fellowship and I'm very excited to, uh, to worship the Lord in the ministry of the Word. So if you would take your Bibles, please open them to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We began our examination this morning of verses 2, second half of verse 2, and all of verse 3. I want to read those for you one more time before we launch back in to our study. The writer says, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So reads the word of God. I want to say that the thrust of this small section as I maintained and argued this morning, is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The reason for making it to these first century believers, their faith was waning. They were starting to drift from a pure orthodoxy and compromise the practice of their faith. So there is obviously a clear connection, beloved, between having a sound view of the preeminence of Christ and a strong Christian walk in witness, right? One produces the other. And if that's true, then so is the opposite. A weak view of the preeminence of Christ produces a weak Christian walk and witness. Now, how does, how does that work exactly? Well, it's simple, really. Whatever you find to be preeminent, superior, the best, the weightiest, the most significant, the greatest worth to you in what you, what you have in your life, it is what you will love and cherish and regard the most, and that you will abide in and follow and obey. Jesus actually said it best when he said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Apparently, Christ no longer held preeminence in the minds of a good many of these first century Jewish Christians. These were Jewish Christians, Hellenists. We really don't have time to get into all of that. You'll have to trust me on that one. Rather, it was certain anti-Christian groups that took the preeminent spotlight in their hearts. Let me give you an example. Groups like the Roman government, their own staunch Jewish families, and the intimidating Jewish religious leaders of their community. Those groups were preeminent because they were a great threat to these Christians. They could hurt these Christians, inflict them with pain, and persecute them. And once these groups became preeminent to these Christians, well, they became the motivating be force behind the embarrassingly weak practice of faith of these Christians. Many of them stopped attending church. They compromised their once strong stand, integrated religious tenets of Judaism into their faith to support their shameful behavior. It should be obvious to anyone reading the letter to the Hebrews then that drifting from orthodoxy is a large part of the result of having lost sight of the preeminence of Christ. I'll say it again. One's view of the preeminence of Christ directly affects one's Christian attitude and activity. If Jesus is not absolutely superior in a person's mind to absolutely everything in that person's life, then that person will not follow Jesus absolutely. We see this with the Jewish Christians of the first century. The writer will go on to show them that those things from the old covenant that they came to believe and came to believe were necessary for their practice of the Christian faith and started to incorporate were in fact no longer necessary. Beyond that, though, he shows them that it was actually dangerous for them to integrate any of this with the true faith because the old covenant, you see, was established by God specifically to usher in something better, 
the Apostle Paul himself communicates this idea about the, the purpose of the law in Galatians 3. You may remember, listen, he says, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. The something better that the entire Old Covenant system anticipated is Messiah. It pointed to his coming, and he had by the time this congregation was established. They were second generation Christians. So Jesus had come and gone, ascended into heaven, approximately 30 years before this letter was even written. Jesus fulfilled the old covenant expectations. He inaugurated a better covenant in its place. These Christians, well, they didn't need to return to the old covenant, and they shouldn't have. Not only did it make no sense at all to integrate aspects of an obsolete system of faith that was by nature anticipatory or preparatory, it was just plain wrong. For example, God instituted the sacrificial system to be an object lesson for the Hebrews of faith. It pointed them ultimately to the sacrifice that Messiah would eventually make. And once Messiah made it, he put an end to the sacrificial system. It served its purpose. There is no longer then any need to sacrifice in anticipation of what Messiah will do because Messiah has done it. He made the perfect sacrifice. He is superior to the Old Testament sacrificial system. So here's where it becomes dangerous. If Jewish Christians incorporated sacrificing into the Christian faith, They essentially deny the sufficiency of Christ's atonement, whether they realized it or not. And the same goes for all aspects of the Old Covenant. Jesus replaced the priesthood of the Old Covenant with his own priestly ministry. He is our high priest. We don't need human mediators anymore because Jesus is a superior mediator between God and man. And to incorporate priests into the Christian faith essentially denies the sufficiency of Jesus' priesthood. We could go on with the temple building itself. We could go on with ceremonial aspects of the law, such as washings and purifications and circumcisions. I think you get the idea. And we see this not only in the first century, but we see it the same behavior today in the church. Many Christians find the faith difficult to live in our ever-changing relativistic American culture. There are secular groups assaulting them on one side of the church and assaulting them on the other side of the church are compromised, if not outright apostate Christian leaders heavily influenced by American cultural norms. So Christians today no doubt feel some of the same tension, some of the same fears and apprehensions as they as these first century Jewish Christians did. In fact, I would argue that in any era, a strong Christian witness will face persecution from government, family members, longtime Christian friends, and harassment from the workplace. And they, like the first century Jewish Christians, will find it tempting to seek refuge in something other than Christ, because it will make their Christian lives less burdensome. Can you see the parallels here? Let me just rehearse this with you. First century congregation certainly did this by adopting a modified practice of the Old Testament law. How's, uh, here's how the, that worked for them. To avoid harsh treatment from the ruling religious community in their town, they toned down their robust faith and they made frequent appearances at the synagogue. And to keep the empire, who didn't recognize Christianity as a legitimate religion in the early part of the first century, off their backs, well, they would make frequent appearances at the temple and offer a sacrifice. And to prevent extended family from breathing down their necks, they might circumcise their children and have them catechized by the local rabbis. Christians in the 21st century are no different. 
If they fear the religious community that they came out of, they might think that they have to keep close ties with it, appease religious leaders. And they might, they might send their children to be catechized by these religious organizations in order to avoid, to avoid dealing with the ire of the religiously devout extended family members or attend a wedding to celebrate a same-sex marriage so they don't jeopardize long-standing friendships. Maybe they participate in showing support for social and political ideas that are postmodern, politically correct, and quite anti-Christian just to stay out of their co-workers' line of fire. Perhaps avoiding civil disobedience when it is called for is a perfect example that is really on the fore of most Christians' brains right now at this very moment around the whole country. We all know that the Bible commands us to obey government. God established it, no matter how corrupt it may become. And Christians should lead the way in being model citizens. But the scripture commands us to obey government unless it is sin to do so. And there are some places in our country where the local government has acted, well, unconstitutionally and have overstepped the boundary between church and state and banned worship services. California, I'm sure you know, is a case in point. And we've all heard of the courageous stand Pastor John MacArthur and Grace Community Church have taken. Other churches are following their lead and good for them. We applaud their stance in this case and would hardly imitate their faith if we were in the same position. We pray we won't have to, but of course God decides what's best for us. Christians in any era can shrink back from, from not just the front lines of the spiritual warfare, but from the good fight itself. They can disarm instead of arm themselves for spiritual battle. And what makes the difference between the Christian soldier in active duty and the one who has gone AWOL is that the former has something that the latter doesn't, a strong view of the preeminence of Christ. The former doesn't see Jesus as supremely better than those things that they run after. We gave a list this morning, peace, pain-free life, uh, trouble-free life, acceptance, popularity, comfort, protection, wealth, and on the list goes. As a result, their Christian lives will take on a very secular appearance and, and go in a secular direction. Their, their witness for Christ will suffer. So one of the important aspects of the Christian life, the primary area that we must be conscientious to preserve, the particular issue on which our spiritual battle turns is the superiority of Christ to all things. Let me put it to you this way. Since American Christians tend to seek the lowest common denominator for living the Christian life and still can call it Christian, I want to put it this way. The strength and vibrancy and effectiveness of your Christian walk is directly proportional to your view of the preeminence of Christ. Did you get that? The strength and vibrancy and effectiveness of your Christian walk is directly proportional to your view of the preeminence of Christ. The stronger your view of the preeminence of Christ, the stronger your Christian walk. So you have no trouble following Christ, you see, over the peaks in life. It's the valleys that you tend to avoid and seek alternate routes until you can circle around and catch up following behind the Lord. In other words, you follow him as, as he ministers to the poor, but not through unjust suffering for God's truth. Yet the Bible has called you to both. We might pat ourselves on the back as good Christians for giving a drink to someone who's thirsty, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry. After all, this is the preoccupation of our country right now. It's in style, you see, to be overly sensitive to injustices. So no one's going to beat you up or slander you or cancel you out over that kind of behavior. But preaching the gospel Standing for God's truth when it's unpopular, rejoicing as Peter and John had because of suffering for Christ's sake, well, that's an entirely different matter. I think I'll pass 
Maybe next time when I'm not so tired or in so much pain or when I'm not kind of coming out of such a rough week. Beloved, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that unless you believe that Jesus is preeminent, superior to everything, you will maintain a strong witness in nothing. You'll cave to your persecutors, capitulate to the public consciousness, conform to the culture, and reconfigure the Christian life and message. Unless we believe that Jesus is superior to everything, we will maintain a strong witness in nothing. Jesus Christ is superior to everything. That's quite a bold statement. It's an absolute statement, isn't it? What exactly does it mean? What does this mean? There's a sense in which Christ is indeed better than everything. Better than a much-deserved vacation in the Bahamas, a stimulus check, a trustworthy friend, a sound and roadworthy tire for your car. Christ is better than your favorite meal or medication that you desperately need to take the edge off that dizzying and weakening chronic pain. Even winning millions in the lottery, and think what you can do with millions. Really, anything that you can think of that brings you all the creature comforts, a raincoat in a sudden, a sudden downpour, a bulletproof vest when caught in the middle of a shootout in the streets of Chicago, a seat belt, or airbags in the moment when someone crosses the double line and hits you head on going 35 miles an hour, a lifeboat in a sinking ship. Now, I'm not being trite or anecdotal with this statement. I'm not coming from the same corner as, as those Christian pastors or conference speakers who bellow out in, in church rallies, Jesus is greater than anything you can ever experience on earth. I don't really know what they mean when they say that. And actually, I'm not sure that, that their hearers do either. That's, of course, by design. It's for effect, you know, to get an amen. They want to woo their audience, work up their emotional side, get them in the worship groove. And so they say things like this without any explanation. And they really don't need to give one. They just let the audience define declarations like that themselves. They just put it out there, and those who want to be there, those who want to go and hear their favorite speakers or have, have a spiritual high, just say, Hallelujah, yes, and amen. Of course, weeks later, when the high is worn off and they're no better after their retreat than they were before they went, their marriages are still strained. They still get depressed over their jobs. They still get sinfully angry when things don't go their way. They still kick the dog if he happens to be around. And they're no better at their spiritual disciplines of regular prayer and Bible study or practicing their spiritual gifts. So how is Christ better than anything? How do you understand this? In what way is Jesus superior or better than anything else in life? Is this really true on a practical level? Tell me, please. What I mean by this is that Jesus his work of redemption, his salvation, his saving grace and truth is better than anything we can know, better than anything we might even need to live. Why? Well, because Jesus can do for you what nothing on earth can do. He can give you a right standing before God. He can justify you, pardon your sins, and reserve a place for you in heaven. He secures your eternal destiny, something that nothing else can do for you. All your creature comforts and necessities go no further than an earthly existence. Now, before I show you how incredibly practical this is, I want to prove this to you. And I want to prove that this contrast between what Jesus gives and what the world gives is actually a dynamic that Jesus himself preached. It's part of Jesus' gospel. Let me give you just three examples. Here we go. The way that Jesus delivered this on one occasion puts it into clear perspective for us. We read in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? The question is rhetorical, designed in this context to solicit a negative answer, which is, it doesn't. Gaining the whole world profits us nothing if in the end our soul is lost for eternity. So in what way, or in that way I should say, it makes absolute sense to grab onto what can save your soul for eternity rather than cling to those things on earth that can make you comfortable or even rich and powerful now. Well, this is true of, of even life-saving things, is it not? If you had a choice between taking a pill that would cure yourself of a terminal illness and allow you to enjoy a normal existence the rest of your life, or forfeit that for the sake of Christ, who can guarantee you a great inheritance in heaven someday, which would it be? In Mark 8, if Mark 8.36 is right, that should be a no-brainer. Well, someone might be thinking, well, why do we have to choose? Well, can we not have it both ways? Can I not be interested in gaining the whole world and still save my soul? All right, that's a fair question. Since Jesus is the one that created the contrast, I would say that's not the right question to ask. You say, what do you mean? Well, we're not questioning whether a Christian who loves God and is about God's work should deny life-saving medicine or be wise in his or her business dealings or or should purposely avoid even becoming successful in business or so wise and successful that that he or she becomes wealthy Abraham a devout Yahweh was a wealthy man in his day David enjoyed a royal status and let's not forget that God gave both Joseph and Daniel the second highest position in the countries in which they lived. Pretty good. No, this is not the issue. Jesus is asking, what is most important to you? What do you worship most, love most, crave most? What takes first priority in your life? That is the right question. And in fact, if you find yourself in a context where you are forced to choose between the best in a context, a best that the world has to offer, the kindest, the strongest, the most pleasant, even life-saving, or obey Jesus, which is it going to be? Here's the something else that Jesus said that carries the same thing in Matthew 10 verse 37. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, once again, we know not to ask, does Jesus want us to hate our family? That's not the right question either. The answer is absolutely no. The right question is this, does Jesus come first in your life even before your family, even before your own desires? If your family forces you to choose between them and Christ, who would win out? One more, in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, Jesus speaking to the crowds in a similar vein said this, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Once again, Jesus argues from lesser to greater. Whatever man can do to you on this earth, even take your life, is nothing compared to what God can do to you, for he has the authority to condemn you for eternity. It makes all the sense in the world, then, to regard God more than man. Yet because we get caught up in the here and now, in what we can see, the temptation to regard man is often greater. Now granted, these absolute statements that Jesus makes are given to unbelievers in a gospel presentation, but they are also for Christians. See, unbelievers know the absolute loyalty that Jesus demands of them, and believers must be prepared to live it. 
And we need to remind ourselves of this truth. I, I wonder this, and maybe you do too, if those who have already chosen to follow Jesus surrender to him at conversion, determined at that moment of their conversion that it is better to live for Christ in order to save their soul in the end, why do so many of us Christians show a greater interest in wanting to save our lives now? Why are so many of us willing to jeopardize our Christian witness for creature comforts? Why do so many of us avoid walking the tough, narrow road in order to ensure the quality of our lives? Do we Christians in America not realize that the quality of eternal life is of inestimable value, worth infinitely more than the quality of an earthly existence? Do we really believe this? The Apostle Paul did. He realized this in even the most severe moments of his trial. He would say things like this, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things, the things which are not seen are eternal. When was the last time you echoed those sentiments in a moment of severe trial? Well, we have before us in the second half of, chap of uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, second half of verse 2, and all of verse 3, seven qualities of Christ. And we covered the first four. Just real quick, by way of review, we talked about his worth, whom he appointed heir of all things. We said Jesus is rich. To know Jesus is to be rich. And when we understand how rich we are in Christ, well, we can endure anything that lessens the quality of a robust life on this earth. We said that there is his creative power through whom he made the world. Jesus created time and history, the events of the created order, and he will bring everything along according to his desired end. And if you are born again, it means that Jesus recreated you in his image for a holy purpose. So our primary purpose in life is to please Christ. We talked about his radiant glory, three. And he is the radiance of his glory. Jesus has an inward glory, the very glory of God that radiates from him and was disp displayed in saving grace and gospel truth for life. Now, this means that our hope for salvation in the fullest sense is found in Jesus alone. The reformers said, solus Christus. With the redeemed life comes forgiveness that only Jesus can provide and change for godliness that only Jesus can provide and a tremendous assurance and confidence found only in him. He clears our conscience from guilt, gives grace sufficient for today and new mercies daily. And then there is his divine essence, number four. He is the exact representation of God's nature. This we said is a reference to his deity, the deity of Christ. Jesus, the Lord, recreated us in his image, which means that he not only owns us, but that he demands our loyalty 100%. Now, our task this evening is to finish the three remaining qualities. Three remaining qualities, they're found in verse 3. Here's number 5. Jesus' administrative power. It says, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Let's talk about his administrative quality, shall we? It is related to the second quality that we considered this morning, Jesus' power to create and re recreate life. We argued then that Jesus Christ is the creator, not just of the material universe, but of everything that is related to the created order, time, events. And he brings all of it along to, its, to his desired end. Well, this phrase, number five, this quality, Jesus' administrative power, takes this and brings it 
a step further, another level, and it teaches us that Christ sustains all that he has created and recreates as Redeemer. Jesus' sustaining work that the writer of Hebrews describes was vastly different from Greek mythology's notion at that time that was portrayed in the lesser pre-Olympian god Atlas, who simply held up the world. You remember Mr. Atlas, do you? He's that scantily clad, muscle-bound guy who was condemned to hold up the dead weight of the world on his shoulders. No doubt this belief was prevalent in the minds of the first century Greeks and Jewish Christians. But the writer emphasizes the stark difference between Jesus' sustaining work and that of Atlas. Atlas does little more than merely hold up creation, a static activity. But Jesus sustains creation in the sense that he carries all events in history forward to his desired ends, a very dynamic activity. The way Jesus does this is by his spoken word. Jesus' word is powerful, beloved. He called Lazarus from the dead. He told the sea to be calm. He spoke absolutely about his death, resurrection, Judah's betrayal, and the destruction of Jerusalem before they all happened. You cannot read the Gospel of John without getting the distinct impression that Jesus was bringing God's plan right along, both for himself and for everyone who had a part in it, right? He guaranteed that every event happened just at the right time, in the right way that it was supposed to. He even told Judas when to go betray him. When the crowds wanted to apprehend him, he mysteriously evaded them by walking right through them. Now, how did he pull that off? Well, the text simply says, because it wasn't his time. John 7.30, so they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. John 8.20, these words he spoke in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him, because his hour had not yet come. But then in John 12.23, the hour had come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and he gave himself over. He told Peter how he would die. In John 20, he said to Peter, when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you don't wish to go. Now he said this signifying by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. What does it mean for us, practically, that Jesus upholds all things by the power of his word? What does it mean? Well, if, as we've proved, Jesus works every part of creation to his desired end through his word, then he can do the same for those he recreated in his own image. That's you and me. Jesus promised us, beloved, that we will realize the fullness of our redemption in heaven someday, and he is actually in charge of working our, our lives toward this end. He is working out our sanctification to that glorious end. This is, this is how Jude expressed it to his congregation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. Jesus sustains us by his word. He did in his public ministry, and he does now through the written word that he left for us. Paul learned from Jesus' words how to be content in every situation, according to his own testimony in Philippians 4. Remember, he said, I don't speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity in any, in every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who, who strengthens me. The more of Jesus' words we know and have abiding in us, the more confident our Christian walk. How is it 
that that hymn goes, that we sing on the Lord's day. How firm a foundation. Verse 2, fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed. For I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. You believe that? Some questions that the text throws at us. Where do you go for your sustenance? Who sustains you? Where do you go for your strength? Do you rest in the Lord's truth? Is his truth your refuge? Are you convinced that contentment is found only in obeying the Lord's will for you, regardless if it makes matters worse? Do you carry on in life in such a way that it becomes evident to those who know you best that you firmly and unhesitatingly believe the Lord is in control of your life has ordered it and will bring it to a glorious end. Do you model to others in the church how to receive with thanksgiving everything from the Lord that he deems to be good and necessary for your maturity? Texts, the, the questions that this text asks that we need to answer in here. Number six, his cleansing power. When he had made purification for sin, of sins. The sacrifice here speaks of Jesus' redemptive quality, or quality as a redeemer. He made a once for all sacrifice, never to be repeated. It was final, it was comprehensive in its effect because it satisfied the Father's just demand for the penalty of our sin. So, this is really a direct reference to his redemptive work on the cross. It's nothing less than the gospel. Jesus saves by his death. Or as Paul put it in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Purification in verse 3 stands for the removal of sin. What we have here is a, is a declaration, really, that Jesus Christ is God's answer to the worst problem, the worst possible scenario that a human being can ever face, what the book of Revelation calls the second death. The greatest news possible counters the worst news possible. Jesus saves us from the wrath of God to come. By his death, he made us clean. This truly is, is really the heart of the matter of the book of Hebrews. The son came to deal with the problem of man's sin. And later in the book, the writer will portray Christ as priest par excellence. And the essence of Jesus' priestly work was offering himself as the perfect sacrifice that put sin away for good. Okay, so what does it mean for us practically that Jesus Christ made purification for our sin? Well, it means two things. One is that we have the assurance that God has pardoned us judici judicially from sin and death. The unbelieving world has conveniently done away with sin and the need for a savior, but their endeavors to soothe their otherwise guilty conscience by doing away with it does not change the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, but that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It also means this. It means that as redeemed believers, we know what to do with sin. We know what to do with our sin. We know everyone sins. Everyone in the world, without exception, sins, both believers and unbelievers. But only believers know what to do with their sin. We can repent, we can ask God for forgiveness, and we can be assured that in Christ we have been forgiven. 
And having said that, though, it is also true that many believers have taken their cue from the world and avoid repentance. Really, to their demise, they don't want to be reminded of their sin, much less own up to it or be responsible to turn to Jesus and be right with him. Plenty of Christians do not keep close accounts with the Lord who cleansed them. They are not quick to look for parental forgiveness from their heavenly Father, maybe because they think it's a given. But Christians are commanded to confess their sins to Christ and to each other when there's been offense. There is nothing else a person can do when he or she is out of fellowship with God but to confess to God and change. It might not be easy, but it's not complicated. Confess and change. We don't want to resort to any substitutes for confession, even though it may make us feel better. There are no alternatives to being right with our Heavenly Father than repentance and change, and we should seek them. We should seek them out. We, should, we shouldn't turn to these counterfeits. Because when we do, beloved, we communicate to others that there are alternatives, that confession and repentance are actually optional for our sanctification. And once we do that, it's a very short step to advocating the same about our justification. Jesus might not be the only way after all. But listen to 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We don't forget that. Jewish Christians of the letter to the Hebrews were fast becoming convinced of alternatives both for sanctification and justification as they were looking to ease the tension brought on by their association with Jesus. But there are no alternative ways to confession and repentance. So says God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those Christians who commit a sinful act and then substitute repentance and confession with something else to avoid uncomfortable situations are sure to cause themselves more pain than they did by their initial sinful act. As the old hymn by Robert Lowry puts it, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As the Apostle John put it in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. A few questions here before we go to number seven. Do you believe that Jesus is preeminent in the area of your sanctification? How about your justification? Would you jeopardize his precious remedy for sin and the gospel message that goes with it just to avoid uncomfortable situations that God himself has brought in your life? Important questions from the text we need to answer here. Well, finally, his exalted status. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The writer refers to Jesus' activity, sitting, and to Jesus' location at the right hand in heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. So what's the significance of this activity and this location? Well, the reference to the son sitting means that he completed his important work that the Father sent him to do on the earth that being his cross work. Once Jesus finished the Father's will, he sat down. So sitting signifies to us that Jesus completed his ministry, and that is very important. It means that his priestly sacrifice for us was sufficient, and it needs never to be repeated again. Now that truth will obviously have a, a, a strong bearing on the faulty thinking of this congregation that it had about the 
about incorporating Old Testament priesthood practices into their faith. But Jesus made the Old Testament priesthood and the priesthood, for that matter, in any era, null and void by his once for all sacrifice for sin. Jesus put the priesthood out of business with his sacrifice. Someone observes that there were no seats in either the tabernacle or the temple because the priest's work was never done. Human priests were always working, always sacrificing. Jesus, on the other hand, finished his work. He is the superlative high priest. Now sitting may mean completeness, completeness, but it doesn't mean inactivity. Jesus is not inactive in heaven. In fact, he's quite engaged in other works there on our behalf. We know he has a mediating ministry. New Testament has much to say about that. Also, Jesus dispenses mercy and grace to us in our greatest times of need. And don't forget that he told the disciples in John 14 that he is going to prepare a place for us. So he's there preparing a place for you. He's also ruling from heaven, to, to which brings us to the location of his seated position. He is seated at the right hand of God. You may or may not know that being positioned at the right hand of a sovereign in the ancient world was the highest place of honor and authority that anyone could ever enjoy next to the sovereign himself. You might remember that Jesus, ha uh, Jesus' disciples had this discussion about who would have the, the highest place of honor and authority that, uh, in heaven and who would sit at Jesus' right hand. Well, Jesus is at the right hand of God in submission to the Father. But as one commentator put it rather cleverly, Jesus is not merely on a seat, but a throne, ruling. And we think of the prophecy in Philippians chapter 2 that at the end of time, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So, what does it mean for us practically that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high? Well, one thing is this. It gives us tremendous assurance that Jesus accomplished what he claimed to have accomplished for us. There is no question his redemptive work had a total and complete effect on us. He has saved us, and we are saved for eternity. Also, Jesus is actively ministering and ruling in the lives of his saints now in the life of this church now. He's ministering to us, ruling in your life, ruling in my life. And we're never out from under the Lordship of Christ. We serve a living Lord. You know, sadly, Jesus' Lordship has fallen on hard times in our day. Some in the church teach that it's, an, it's optional in the Christian life, if, if you can believe that, that we don't have to submit to Jesus if we don't want to. This is a huge huge error that misleads many. Others pit Jesus' lordship against God's grace and teach Christians that they don't have to obey the Lord because they're all under grace. I guess that means that you can behave any way you want and still delight in the fact that you're going to heaven someday. I can assure you that thinking is completely foreign to Scripture. Those who, see, who do see Jesus' lordship as undeniable in their lives, well, they still struggle with certain biblical commands. And I don't just mean those who are finding obedience difficult in a moment of weakness. I mean that some have turned a blind eye to what they know the Bible says about their situation. And they follow their own way. Beloved, how do you live with the Lord who reigns? Have you experienced the sweet delight that comes from knowing that you are in his will? Are there things in your Christian walk right now that you know to be out of line with Scripture but have done nothing about it? How do you think that will end? How much lag time do you think there should be between learning what Jesus wants you to do and doing it? Important questions from the text.
that we need to answer from the heart. I want to say in closing that we are well familiar with those lapses in our walk where in those sinful moments we have found other things to be better than Christ. That's why they're sinful moments. And no doubt we will do so again. Our mindset, however, should be that we would not want to. That we would fight to avoid that. And when we do become guilty of exalting something above our Lord, that we would repent immediately and train ourselves away from, from such spiritual adulterous activity. May we all share the same sentiments of David in Psalm 16, verse 2, and strive to prove them true in our lives until Christ returns. Let them be our parting words tonight. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Father, we are so very humbled to be in your presence, to know that we don't deserve to be here and to be in the position that Christ has secured for us, Christ alone, his work alone. And Lord, we are so very thankful and we rejoice in this hour and we're so glad that we could rally around the truth together in your presence. We pray that you've been pleased with our activity. We pray that you would look into our hearts tonight and see that there we love you and that we do want to follow you and that it is our earnest desire to be 100% sold out to Christ. Oh God, we pray for your patience as we strive to beat down those things that usurp and vie for our affections against our great Lord and Savior. We pray that, that Lord, you will be pleased with our struggle for holiness, to express, rather, that which Christ has secured for us, our holiness. And that as we do so, Lord, you would be honored that you would be honored in our lives, in our families, that you would be honored here in this place, a light to this dark area of the world, and that Christ would be exalted. Let us never lose a sense of the preeminence of our great Lord and Savior, and let us follow gladly after him wherever he leads. For we know that in the end it will only wind up in glory where we will see him face to face and there we will be like him. This is our earnest prayer, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.